So we're going to go ahead and get started today. <clears throat> and as I frequently remind you guys, the uh, <clears throat> one of the uh, great prerogatives of your teachers that they can always show pictures of their children. <laughs> so this is Shelley, Sean, and Patrick. And Patrick really does not wear glasses. <clears throat> but if he did, this would be the pair he would pick, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and there's Shelley and Madison. Seems like it wasn't that long ago that Shelley was that size, but and there she is. <laughs> She's got some wild hair. Patrick's got really red hair, and everybody says, where'd that come from? And then you see her curly hair, and so where'd that come from? Because I don't know where that came from either. So um, here we are again in the book of John, and um, I have uh, uh, struck, continued to struggle uh, with how to make your way through um, the book of John in an adequate way. Uh, without spending an insane amount of time. Uh, I am going to try to pick up the pace a little bit, and I'm going to maybe at the end of class ask you to indulge me on a couple of chapters. So uh, we're going to start today real quick because I feel like we did cover the actual issues of what was said in the book of John chapter 8, uh, in which is chapter 6, chapter 8, chapter 10 to me are very theological chapters uh, and sometimes difficult to... Uh, cover because you can really get bogged down into what is actually being said. And I don't know that that's necessarily the point of this class. But anyway, just in review again, we'll start off with our usual slide. I shouldn't remake this into some sort of other fancy font or something that so it looks different. But anyway, the, the purpose of this book is, is to encourage people to believe in Jesus. And not just to believe just for the fun of it, but that by believing in Jesus, John's point is, is that that's what saves people. And he wants you to, by believing that you will have life in his name. And, and as we have pointed out and will continue to point out, the stories and the, and the history that we have in the book of John is not randomly picked out. It's put in here for a reason. And it's put in here, again, to make these points to people so that you can be reminded of what the real purpose of the book is. In chapter 8, there are just a few points that I wanted to make, and some of those are just some of the assertions of Jesus that we see being made. And these are very strong passages. These are not little sort of, oh yeah, by the way, statements. If you think about what Jesus is saying and the magnitude of these comments that Jesus makes, and, and you know, you think about anybody else making that statement. It's like, hey, listen to me. I'm, I'm teaching the book of John, and I speak for the Father. You know, I'm, I'm not going there. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to do that because I don't qualify. And when you talk to people, you say, I stand with the Father. The Father sent me here to teach this class today. Like, you'd be like, eh, that's a little presumptuous of you there, uh, Dwayne. Uh, or I'm from above, you're from below. Whoa. I mean, who am I to make those kind of comments? If you put yourself in that position and you think about Jesus saying that to the people that thought they were from above, the people that thought they were Abraham's children. And then you have Jesus getting up and making these comments to the most religious of all these people and reminding them that God sent me. You are from below. I'm from above. God sent me down here. Those are monumental statements. And when you read the John chapter 8 and you come to verse 58, at the finale of this passage, is Jesus finally says, in essentially quoting the Old Testament by saying, I am. So he wasn't messing around. He wasn't being subtle about what his claims were. Jesus is pretty clearly declaring himself to be the Messiah. So not only did he do that, I think they knew that he was declaring himself to be the Messiah. Their real problem was is that they had a real misunderstanding of what the Messiah was. They still thought the Messiah was going to be this king on earth is going to restore Jerusalem and Israel, and we would retain our previous glory of the days of David and so on, and that's what they thought this would be, so that they could kick these nasty Romans out of their world. So these other statements that we won't read through are other statements that Jesus makes in chapter 8 that are really also very, very uh, strong statements uh, that he is making to these very religious people. And he's basically saying, mm, you ain't it. You know, they're claiming to be the children of Abraham, and he's going, mm-mm, that's not you. They're claiming to be 
all this. And Jesus is saying, mm, you ain't all this. These people are more all this than you are. And so when you put that in the context of stories like the Good Samaritan in, in Luke chapter 10, and you read that passage and you think, well, what's he saying there? He said, you're not even as good as a Samaritan. Whoa. I mean, you know, when we think about what that actually is saying, because you think maybe a Samaritan is just like somebody that lives, you know, oh, well, they live in Lewisburg. It's not exactly what he's saying about those people. He's saying that they're nasty, the lowest of the low, hypocrites, you know, they're just half-breeds. Whatever they want to say about them is very derogatory. He wasn't saying they're just from another place. And so Jesus makes these statements of judgment on the Pharisees primarily. So in the statement that Jesus makes, or that is made, said, who do you think you are when the Pharisees say that to him? And I do think that that's kind of the question that, you know, that we should be asking is, you know, who do you think Jesus was? And the stories that we're reading in, in John, I think that declo those declarations have to be made. It's like, who do you actually think Jesus was? What did you actually think Jesus did when he died on the cross? And those are instrumental theological discussions, and they lead to a lot of crazy discussions with people and about, you know, predestination or what does it mean to be a sinner or what is sin or how bad is sin. These questions all revolve around who do you think Jesus was? And Jesus asked that question. Um, you know, he asked that and um, asked Peter those questions like, who do you think I am? It's like, well, some people thought this, some people think that. And he, who did he declare? He said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. <clears throat> so at the end of that passage in chapter 8, we've come to that final statement that Jesus makes, and it is clearly the point of chapter 8. So remember that for the test. So in chapter 9 we start... With, uh, with this being the theme, is that I'm the light, which is another declaratory statement that Jesus makes. And he's already made that statement in chapter 8. And here he begins telling this, we get this story about the blind man. So chapter 9 is pretty much all about the healing of the blind man. And not just any blind man, but the man that was blind from birth. So as we start that passage, oh look, an eyeball. Don't you just love PowerPoint? Um, <laughs> so here are the characters in this story. We have Jesus, we have the apostles, we have the blind man, we have his parents, we have the Pharisees, and then we have observers, and those are the people that actually are at the beginning of the story, maybe uh, the blind man's neighbors. Uh, as we begin this, though, I thought this passage was especially important, and, and we'll go through some passages a little bit farther in, is that this idea of being blind is a theme that's used over and over and over in all the Gospels. In this particular passage, Jesus is making that comment about the Pharisees, and, the, and he's saying this to his apostles. He says, you know, you, you got to be really careful because you guys are following blind people. When you got blind people following blind people, they're both going to fall into the pit. So here's our first little introduction here. I think we can hear. I never could figure out who this girl on this thing was, but she's just kind of passing by. <laughs> As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been born blind. Whose sin caused him to be born blind? Was it his own or his parents' sin? His blindness has nothing to do with his sins or his parents' sins. He is blind so that God's power might be seen at work in him. As long as it is there, he must keep on doing the work of the Musa. Nice. Your face in the 
So um, we'll come back to this story in a minute. I chopped it up. Uh, so just a few other passages. Healing the blind was uh, something that was not unique to chapter 9 of John. It's included in several other passages of, in the New Testament. Not this blind man, but other blind men uh, are included. So if you I always think about Pam. She's over here taking notes all the time. So, Pam, you want to write these down. Uh, you can read about these later. Uh, but uh, we do, do remember uh, in our own mind other times that Jesus healed somebody that was blind. Uh, and these passages are just uh, references to those. Uh, we won't belabor that at all, but just so you'll know that this was uh, not uh, a totally unique event in the, in the miracle and healing uh, ministry of Jesus. Then they took to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. The day that Jesus made the man and cured him of his blindness was a Sabbath. Now I see. 
how they can kill you with your blindness. I have already told you and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Maybe you too would like to be his disciple. They insulted him and said, you are that fellow's disciple. But we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for that fellow, however, we do not even know where he comes from. What a strange thing that is. You do not know where he comes from, but he cured me of my blindness. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He does listen to people who respect him and do what he wants them to do. Since the beginning of the world, nobody has ever heard of anyone giving sight to a person born blind. Unless this man came from God, he would not be able to do a thing. You were born and brought up in sin. So this this is a this is very interesting. We'll we'll do a little comparison in a second to another previous miracle in the book of John. Uh, but I do think it's kind of remarkable when we read this section where the Pharisees and all their haughtiness sitting around this table, uh, being all religious and everything, and then just getting kind of shown up by a guy that was blind because you know he just calls them on the carpet for their lack of logic. You know they're. They're making these statements about Jesus. Well, you know, you know he, he's a sinner. It's like, well, I don't know if he's a sinner or not. I just know that what well, I used to couldn't see and now I can see. He really simplifies this whole thing about who Jesus was because they're struggling with it because of their own presuppositions, which is they've decided beforehand that this was not the Messiah. So everything they see, they have to interpret in some other way. But when you have somebody that's not thinking through that problem in that same sort of way, who's just looking at the very facts in front of them and they're not struggling with their own presuppositions, they're, they're just looking at the fact that they've come to a different conclusion, which is, I don't know. I just know I couldn't see and now I can see. And then he begins in talking about, as you saw in that little video, that when he's trying to describe to them that they maybe that they could possibly be wrong about who he was because you know how could a sinner possibly do what was done so he's kind of rounding their logic back at them again by making that comment which is well maybe he's not a sinner maybe he is not what you think he is and uh, I think that that's really interesting and I like the way they did the video where they just see when he finally says that to them uh, at the end uh, of when he makes this comment is uh, said the man, verse 30 now the man answered him isn't this remarkable you don't know where he comes from yet he opened my eyes we know that God does not listen to sinners he listens to godly men who do and those are the ones who do his will and no one ever heard of anybody opening somebody's eyes that were born blind and if this man were not from God how could he he couldn't do anything and they just, you could just sense this passage in verse 34 it says, it's, and then they replied, it's almost like you could just see them shaking. It says, you are steeped in sin. That's all they could think of. They couldn't even think, come, come back to what he had just said because his logic was relatively clear to them that they were wrong and they just couldn't accept that, that they were wrong about anything because they really thought that they had searched the scriptures daily as Jesus has said to them. You search the scriptures every day trying to find out these things and, and you don't even know who I am. All right, we'll finish up. Here. When Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man. Do you believe in the Son of Man? Tell me who he is, sir, so that I can believe in him. You have already seen him. He is the one who is talking with you now. I believe, Lord. And you knelt down before Jesus. I came to this world to judge, so that the blind should see, and those who see should become blind. So here, here's the dudes watching. So it is interesting in the description about who, when the Pharisees were talking with the blind man, 
Did you notice how that there wasn't any particular moment in time when, when they asked the blind man, did Jesus do this to you? They, they kind of left Jesus out of it, but you know they know that. I mean, they've already, in the book of John, they've already struggled with everything that goes on where there's something miraculous going on. They call this big meeting and they all get, to rent, get together to talk about Jesus. And so there's just this assumption, well, that's a Jesus guy. And I don't, you know, I don't know. But we'll see it all culminate again, I think, in chapter 11 uh, when uh, Lazarus is raised. So, a few questions. So why was this man, why was he blind? So the first question that comes up in this passage is the apostles asking Jesus, why is this man blind? Was it because of something his mom and dad did or is it something that he did? So why was this man blind? So he's been born, I don't know how old he was. So he's been blind his whole life. And so was, was there a purpose for his blindness? Say that again. So is that really fair that we have this guy who's been blind his whole life just so this moment could happen and we could get a video of it? Okay, it's a really tough question. And I did refer you to a passage last week, which I'm sure you all ran home to read, Exodus chapter 4, verse 11. And it's a passage where God is talking to Moses, telling him he wants to go free the children of Israel. And I don't know, we can just flip over there and read that real quick. Exodus, it's in the front, right? I'm getting confused. It's in the Old Testament. So I'm not going to belabor this point, but just so if you want to like think through this a little bit, you can at a later time. In verse 11 of chapter 4, the Lord said to, to Moses, Who gave the man his mouth? Who makes, him, who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what you're supposed to say. So here's a passage where God is talking to Moses about things, and that statement is made. Is, so who made him blind? And the answer is this, God makes him blind. At least this passage in, in, that we see in Exodus, that's true, and it seems apparent that it's true in the way that Jesus describes what's about to happen at the beginning of chapter 9, is that this man was made blind. I struggle with this a little bit, but you know, there's a lot of this in the New Testament. And one of probably the strongest passages that I think we would read is in Romans chapter 9. And in Romans chapter 9, hey, it's, this is chapter 9 too, uh, that Paul makes that statement about that, um, that be before Jacob and Esau were born, that God loved Jacob and hated Esau. And then it seems like, well, who, Paul makes lots of rhetorical questions that he thinks somebody's going to ask. He says, well, how, how could it, God be upset with us if we are not what he wants us to be, if that's how he made us? And, and then Paul says, who are you, uh, who are you to talk back to God? And then he says, isn't it God's prerogative to take the same lump of clay and make something that's for common use and something for special use? Hmm. I never thought about that, but here we are. We've got this passage, and it's possible that this person was born blind for this particular moment because God used him for that purpose. So Jesus is clearly saying that, and I don't know if that makes you feel uncomfortable or not, but you might be asked about that someday by somebody who finds it sort of offensive to think that someone was born blind at the choice of God. I I'm not sure that we know enough about how God works for any of us, including me or anybody else in this room, to jump up and down and tell us how God does things. I don't know, I don't know that, but I do know that that's an important passage. It's also interesting that this idea of the very fact that they're asking this question is interesting uh, because there is that idea of retribution, that because you've done something bad or your parents had done something bad, something bad has happened to you. And, you know, we see that, and I know that we've had a class on, you've all been in a class on Job, and that was one of the things you have to kind of start out when you read the book of Job, understanding that generally speaking, people thought, well, bad things happen to people because they did bad things. And Job had bad things happen to him, and the people that came to visit and talked to him 
reminded him that he must have done something really bad because this is why God did that. And so we see this particular passage where the, where the apostles who are Jesus' apostles, they're walking around with Jesus and they're asking him this question. It's like, well, well who did that? Did he do it? I mean, he only gave him two choices, his parents or him. And so there was this sort of an assumption of the Jewish thought process at this point in time and before that there was a relationship between the bad things that happened to people and the, and the good things that happened to people. Uh, and when you get to the end of this story, look, look what, they, what they said in verse 34. What did the Pharisees say? And we've already alluded to this. When they got so upset with him, they didn't know how else to insult him. And what did they say? That you were steeped in sin. That's just the way you are. You're, you're this way because you were steeped in sin. So this idea about retribution from God because of our behavior is clearly packed into this. If you will, look over and let me see if I can find the right passage here. Uh, I think it's... I am blanking. Maybe I have it somewhere. No, I don't. There's... I have another passage, I think, it's in, I think it's Matthew 15, but I'm not sure. But anyway, there's a passage that basically makes that comment that uh, Jesus says that that's not true. I'll, um, I'll hunt that up and be sure I bring that up next week. I'm sorry for my failure here, <laughs> blanking on that. Uh, so let's just stop with that. I don't know if anybody has any questions about that. I'm pretty sure I don't have any answers, so I'm not sure it's worth asking me the question. <laughs> but I do think this is an interesting passage because Jesus basically says this man was born blind because God made him that way for this very moment. And that's just the way it is. So also, just out of fun, uh, it's interesting to take this passage and compare it to what we read in, uh, in John in chapter 5 when we read about the, man, the healing of the blind man and the lame man, and you compare them right and left in a sense. Can you think of things that make these similar or different? You remember the lame man? It was in John chapter 5, you know, 25 weeks ago. <laughs> uh, anyway, any ideas? But did the physical act, I mean, the lame man was already standing and Jesus told him to take his mat. Right. That is a difference, actually, is that there was one kind of did have more of an action than the other one. He did tell him to pick up his mat. Both of these events occurred on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. They all happened on Saturday. So we've kind of had a list of previously shown miracles that occur on the Sabbath day and that warranty on my cars out. Um, <laughs> so um, the lame man, um, I, I don't know, if you read the story about the lame man, it's kind of like Jesus, like the lame man kind of sells Jesus out. And it's like, who did this to you? He said, oh, that Jesus guy did. <laughs> and then the blind man, he's, he's much more like, Mm, appreciative. I mean, he's like, keep, he's not, he sort of keeps it to himself. I don't know that, I don't know that I could really say that's true or not. So they both occur in Jerusalem. One gets sent to the pool of Shalom. The other one gets basically sent to the pool at Bethesda. So there's differences, but, but they are fairly monumental and, and hard to fake. Uh, you know, this guy was not able to walk. People knew that. They saw him. He had been crippled for 38 years. The blind man had been crippled, I mean, had been blind since birth. Uh, so there's a lot of comparison of those, and these had clear physical uh, limitations and how that affected their life. I think the one thing about the blind man is, is the fact that his neighbors saw that. It says his neighbors and those who knew that he was blind. And then the lame man had all these people who also recognized him. Isn't this the guy that was sitting over here, you know, getting money from us forever? Uh, so it's an interesting comparison. So the point of, of this in the book of John, which we have pointed out over and over and over, is not just some random story about Jesus healing a blind man. This was a blind man who's not mentioned in other 
Gospels. So that makes it unique and it fits in the pattern of the book of John. Uh, there are, but there are other blind men who are cured uh, or made given sight in the New Testament that are not in the book of John. So it's not a unique event, but it is a unique teaching. And so John's point is to make these ideas uh, really, really clear. What does Jesus ask him at the end, starting in verse 35, and that when Jesus comes up and introduces himself to the blind man who had previously not seen him because hmm, he couldn't see, uh, what does he say that fits into the pattern of this book? I am a failure as a teacher, I can tell. <laughs> what does he say? Do you believe? So that's the whole point of this book is Jesus, John's writing this, this stuff down because he wants people to believe. Jesus comes up to this man and he says, do you believe in the Son of Man? And so he does. Spiritual blindness is what this whole story is about. And really in a, in, in a roundabout way, a large part of the book of John is about spiritual blindness. And so when we think about the spiritual blindness in comparison to what the Pharisees had and continued to have versus the blind man who used to have blindness and now he did not have blindness. And that passage that we started out with in Matthew 15 and that idea is that, uh, uh, that you got these blind people leading blind people. And who's he talking about? He's talking about the Pharisees. They're blind, and they've got this spiritual blindness that they... And what's the difference between the blind man and the Pharisees? The blind man knew he was blind, and the Pharisees thought they could see everything. And Jesus condemns that in, in later passages where he basically says is that because you don't admit your blindness is why you're going to be lost. You think you can see. And that's what he says here at the end of John chapter 9. He says in verse 40, Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and ask, What? Are we blind too? So the Pharisees heard Jesus talking to the blind man. They asked him that question. And Jesus says, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim that you can see, you are, your guilt remains. So just as an aside to that idea too, and let's jump back up to verse 39. And Jesus said, For judgment I have come into the world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. So what's interesting about that passage and talking about the Pharisees again? Another passage is that he came not to judge the world. Right, and so John chapter 12, verse 47, Jesus says, I didn't come into the world to, to judge the world. So how do, you, how do you put those two verses together, even in the same book? And Jesus makes that statement here is that I didn't come to condemn the world in one passage, and yet I did come to judge them such. Think about John chapter 3, when we've read over and over again, John chapter 3, verse 16, starting really in verse 17, that Jesus did not come into the world to to condemn the world. But then he goes on and he talks about, again, light and darkness. I am the light. Again, keep that message in mind and we'll read John chapter 3 through real quickly here. For God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in him stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So the verdict is that light has come into the world and, and that whole passage that we read, what's he saying there? He's basically saying, I don't, I don't really have to condemn you. I didn't come here to condemn you. But if you don't come into the light, you're already, you're just maintaining your condemnedness. I didn't come and make you that way. And in a way, that's what Jesus is saying in this passage is that you've passed judgment on yourself already. Judgment has already been declared because you don't believe in me. So just real quick, some passages, and I don't want to, I don't know if I've got any time here, but if you look at the, <clears throat> a few passages that we've talked about uh, that I think kind of point out this idea of light and darkness, uh, the passage that we read last week in chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians 
It said the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Jesus Christ, who is the image of God. Um, so I, I start with that passage because I, I just really wanted you to see this idea of that Paul is drawing on that idea of light and darkness and blindness and seeing and he says that the God of this age has done what? He's blinded the minds of unbelievers uh, so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of glory of Christ. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 9 says, But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. So again, Peter's drawing on that idea about spiritual blindness. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in darkness. So here's John again in 1 John, uh, same author, making this statement about anyone who claims to be in the light and uses that light and darkness concept again. But whoever hates his brother is in darkness and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. And, and, I, and I love this because, you know, when you think about what the gospel is all about and, and this idea that Jesus is, or John's making the points about what Jesus said is that, you know, the gospel is the light and, and you know, being in a sinful world is darkness. And then look at how John, what John sort of equates with that is that whoever hates his brother is in darkness. And so that idea of, you know, how bad is it to hate your brother may be kind of the same level of concern as it is to neglect the gospel, is that that's how important that is to John as he makes that point, is that that idea about darkness and being blinded. I, I, again, I know you all know this. I just think sometimes when you... If, if you have it all spread out everywhere and you see light and dark, light and dark, light and dark, when you take it all and you just all compact all those statements of light, dark, blindness, and you put them in a box, I mean, they're just like busting out of the box because there's so many of them because that analogy is so strong in helping us understand what Jesus did because we look at Jesus and, I don't know, we all have our own views about that, but it, it's it's like the light. You've been in darkness your whole life and Jesus is the light. The gospel is the light. Loving your brother is the light. That that idea of what does it look like to be a Christian, what does it look like to be thankful for what Jesus did for you, it's like I used to be blind. So here we have this passage that we just read the majority of already. I'm not going to reread that, but again, you see these words of light and darkness over and over and over. So it does kind of culminate into this uh, passages, and the, the, the story of the healing of the blind man it is kind of the rise of that thought in the book about light and darkness, but it doesn't start in chapter 9. It starts in chapter 1 it really reaches an explanation in chapter three. It hits another high point in chapter eight, but this is where it rises to that level where the blind man makes that statement is, is that I was blind and now I can see, and he makes it readily clear that this passage is now true. So the big thing for us is, is that the blind man knew he was blind and. And, and then that's the question for us is, is, do you realize that you were or are blind? And it's very difficult. And that's why it was so hard for these Pharisees that were sitting around in our little movie, which is just so you know, it's just fiction put together. It's not really actual video from the event, although it seems like it at times to me. Um, they were sitting there in all their haughtiness and their pride sitting around this table making a judgment something that they just could they weren't even capable of, of commenting on and yet they were sitting with the person who had all the knowledge the guy that was blind i mean he's the guy that knows he has all the answers to these questions and they're asking him questions and he's giving them the answer and they just simply cannot understand the answer because they love the darkness and it's hard to imagine that this religious sect had gotten to this point where they were what they thought was 
the light was actually the dark, which again brings out that statement in chapter last verses of chapter 9 is that when Jesus says that to the Pharisees that overheard this conversation is that, you know, you're, because you claim you can see, your guilt remains. So that's our question. You know, do we find ourselves in this situation at all? Are there certain types of blindness that we have? Are there questions of people's, what we think about somebody's religious position or somebody's religious thought or something that we read in scripture that we might disagree about, would we say, oh, well, you know, that rises to this level that we can't even understand the questions that they're asking. We certainly can't understand the answers that somebody might give because is it possible that we have some level of blindness? And I would say, yeah, I think we really do. And a lot of blindness that we see in the Pharisees came because of their pride. It, didn't come, it, it came because they were just so sure that they had studied the scripture so well that when the Messiah showed up, they were absolutely, positively going to see that. They had prepared their whole life studying scripture, looking for Jesus. And when Jesus comes, they couldn't even see him. So, you know, they're looking for this light, and it was right there in front of them. <clears throat> and the blind man saw it, and they did not. <clears throat> All right, I'm gonna go through this real quick. So this is some of the things that we keep making these points about the contrast that John draws in his gospel. Uh, just a couple questions. <clears throat> Can you cure yourself of your own blindness? You study hard enough, you do all right, you gotta you know, make a list, do all the things. Can you cure yourself of blindness? Uh, do you think that the blind man worried that he would wake up someday and he would be blind again? Just a question. And could others around you, in, a, in the first part of the story, that um, it said that the blind man was walking around and his neighbor saw he wasn't blind anymore. Could your neighbors tell that you weren't blind anymore? Was there some difference in the way you acted, that you had gone from being blind to not being blind, that people would know that? No, oh, the end. So before we go, we have to do this. We'll have to sing. So we're going to sing Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was Next week.